Okay, today I basically want to try to show you how we go from a complex RNA, or what we call a precursor RNA, basically what we get for the genomic DNA, and basically get it to a form that we want. So a lot of us have seen this previous type of form right here. We're basically dealing with uh, intron and exon type of structure. Uh, we'll maintain our structure, so we got the 5' end and the 3' end of our RNA, and the boxes are going to indicate exons. And one of the things you'll notice is what's in between the boxes are what we call introns, and we need to get rid of those. So ultimately, we want to end up with a product just like this. So that means these little components in here need to disappear, and we need to get rid of those. So I want to briefly talk about how we go about doing that. So within a cell, when we look at the genomic DNA, it's a very complex entity. Uh, basically one gene or something that could eventually code for a protein covers a large amount of genomic region. That genomic region in the area of the gene will then be transcribed. But in a eukaryotic cell, it's not transcribed right into the messenger RNA. It's actually transcribed most of the time into what we call a precursor uh, RNA. It's then that precursor RNA will need to be spliced uh, to get rid of the introns and put the exons back together into our normal form. So what we're going to see here is how the process will occur from moving this to here. Okay, what I've done here is kind of cut this RNA uh, into, or this, cut this precursor RNA into a bunch of different pieces to kind of demonstrate this a little better. So the ultimate goal, if we go back, is to get this product right here. So if we go back to our precursor, we'll see that we need to take these exons and glue them back together. How the cell is going to do that is with a protein RNA complex called a spliceosome. So essentially what it's going to do is run over the RNA and look for specific sites where it can splice one exon to another. So there's a specific sequence that it's looked for. I'm not going to go into the detail at this point. But basically what it's going to do is remove this and basically remove these introns. So it's then going to take these exons and put them together, kind of like that. So we still have our 5' prime and 3' prime orientation, which is important. Uh, but now we've gotten rid of this, I don't want to call it junk, but what we call introns. Now what's interesting about this, and one of the reasons I chose different colors for my exons, is there's a concept that a lot of people talk about called alternative splicing. This is the ability, then, of this one precursor mRNA to actually lead to a variety of different messenger RNAs. So, for example, instead of keeping the blue exon, we may splice that out. So, actually jump over it a little bit. So, as you can see now, when we put these together, we actually have a different RNA product. We may then want to get rid of the green one, keep the blue one, and once again you'll start to see that we have a different type of RNA. So what this means is this is a difference code because these boxes are only representing A, U, G's, and C's in terms of the RNA. And it's the code that will then go to the ribosome that will later be translated. So based on the difference in the code we're going to get into a difference of the amino acids. Some other things I want to briefly talk about is uh, messenger RNA also has some characteristics about it that are fairly unique. Um, one of the things when it's being transcribed, on the 5' prime end will be placed a cap. Uh, the essential purpose of the 5' prime cap is to increase RNA stability and decrease the likelihood of it getting broken down by an enzyme like RNAs. Also on the 3' prime end will be what we call polyadenylation. So basically, a big long tail of adenine is going to be added to the 3' end. Once again, these are for a couple reasons. Stability, to increase the stability of that molecule. RNA has a tendency to be relatively unstable, uh, so it at least makes it to the ribosome. And it also probably helps target it to the ribosome. So the ribosome indeed knows, you know, this is the sequence I need to make my protein from, make my amino acid sequence from. So you'll typically see these go along with mRNA. Uh, the description of a 5' cap and a poly A tail. 
Now, in the laboratory, what's interesting about this is how some of this chemically can be used to get the product you desire. So as you can see with our genomic piece here, or what we call our precursor mRNA, uh, this is not beneficial in the laboratory in the sense of being able to clone this into bacteria and get the bacteria to make the protein from it. Uh, one of the reasons are typically in prokaryotic cells they don't use the spliceosome to actually uh, manipulate their DNA. Their DNA leads right into RNA and that RNA is defined as mature so then it can be translated right into the amino acid sequence. So if you jumped a DNA sequence that looked like this into a prokaryotic cell like a bacteria, it probably would be confused and wouldn't actually make the product you desire. So one of the things you'd have to do is somehow find a way to get this product but to get it into a DNA sequence. And this is where the poly A tail can come into use. So you can purify RNA from cells and what you'll want to do is kind of enrich your sample for mRNA. So you can either take a column or bind a poly T sequence to a, a resin or to beads and when you run your sample through you'll see that your mRNA with the poly A tails will actually stick to the resin. You can then elute uh, that poly A off of the beads and then elute your mRNA into a tube. Also another thing is this is RNA and we're not good at cloning RNA so we need to get it back into a DNA form. So this is where we take advantage of our friends the, the viruses and they actually many viruses produce an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So they have the ability to convert RNA back into single stranded DNA. So in a laboratory uh, a number of companies come up with kits that essentially you can purify the RNA and then to kind of prime that reverse transcriptase going back into DNA, you use a poly T tail to prime that reaction, kind of similar to what you'd see in PCR. That reverse transcriptase will then bind to the poly T tail and reverse transcribe this into DNA. And then there's a further DNA polymerase in there that will then make the other strand or the complementary strand of DNA then all you really need to do is incubate this tube with RNAs to get rid of the original mRNA and you're left with the tube of your double stranded DNA. At this point you can then clone it into a vector and you've created what we call a cDNA molecule or a cDNA clone. Uh, it stands for complementary clone because it's complementary to the mRNA. One last thing I'd like to indicate to you is when we really look at our mRNA What's in the colored region is the actual code that's going to be translated into the protein. So the outlined white boxes here are actually what we call UTRs. So what UTR stands for is untranslated region. So we got a 5 prime UTR and we got a 3 prime UTR. These are essentially regions where it may allow the ribosome to bind to. They may be regions that are important for RNA stability, which once again we talked about is, is pretty important. Uh, but essentially what we have here at the line is this is typically where you would see your AUG or your start codon. And then on the other end here would be a stop codon. So you may see these terms periodically. So the UTRs are part of the mRNA, but they are ultimately going to be cut out and will not be part of the actual protein, which we kind of see here.